we did, really did have a wild week at Vacation Bible School. It was a great time. I mean, see kids kneeling at an altar. They raised over $2,000 for drilling wells in Mozambique. I mean, they did awesome time. What an important thing that they were doing, that being able to help. Like that. But it was a wild time. If you were here, it was noisy. It was loud. They sang. They screamed. They did cra- all that stuff. It was a great time. Well, I want to tell you about one wild dog. We called him the Wonder Dog. Blazer had been part of our family for nearly 17 years. And I got to tell you, if there is a hall of fame for dogs, and if Walt Disney was right and all dogs go to heaven, then Blazer is in the hall of fame today looking for a heavenly fire hydrant right now. But since he's gone and since Terry is in here, I guess I can confess something to you. You see, I had a problem with Blazer for nearly all 17 years of his life. It it wasn't a new problem that cropped up when he got older and sick. It it, it was a 17-year-old problem. It was a long-term problem. It, It was a problem I had to deal with personally over the years. The problem wasn't his personality, a sweeter mutt you'd never be able to find. He, he saw every person as a friend and every day as a party. He, he was always excited to see someone come to our home. I had no problem with Blazer's attitude. I, I never had to worry about him nipping at a child. He, he saw it as his job to protect any child that came into our home. He was part border collie, and, and he knew his job was to protect the defenseless. I didn't have a problem with his attitude. I did have a problem with his habits. He knew he wasn't supposed to get into the garbage, uh, and and he never would when we were in the kitchen, but let us leave the house and leave that jar, and and he was known to strew garbage all over the kitchen floor. Not only that, but he refused to quit begging while we were sitting at the table eating a meal. It didn't matter who came into our home. Uh, We could have had the President of the United States eating dinner with us, and Blazer still would have made a nuisance of himself begging. He, he knew nothing of proper etiquette when, when we had guests in our home. He, he had been known to go up to total strangers and sniff them and discover some interesting new smell and just keep sniffing them until we were embarrassed. Worse than that, he had been known to plop himself right down in the middle of the living room while we were trying to have a conversation with our guests, and that's the moment Blazer decided he had to lick himself. He had been known to get sprayed by a skunk and come into the house and immediately rub his face on the carpet or against the furniture. He had been known to do his business in the wrong places, especially when he got older and sicker. And I'm even embarrassed to admit this, but he was also known to quench his thirst in the most absolutely disgusting places. You know what I'm talking about. I mean, it would have been one thing if he had done those things when it was just family at home. And, and, and we would be allowed to be a little bit more relaxed with him and, and not insist on him following proper etiquette. But for Blazer, it didn't matter who was around. He would do the most disgusting dog-like things, no matter who might be there. He never acted as if he was embarrassed by his transgressions. Now, what kind of behavior is that? You understand my problem with that dog. And you might respond by saying, uh, Fred, he's just acting like a dog. And you would be right, absolutely right. Blazer's problem was not a blazer problem. He had a dog problem. It's a dog's nature to do disgusting things and not be embarrassed. In fact, he usually wanted to be rewarded for his behavior. So, so you understand, it's his nature that I wanted to change. Not just his behavior, mind you. An obedient school for dogs would have changed his behavior, but I wanted to go deeper. I wanted to change who he was. I know, I know you're thinking, "Ah, it's just weird Fred being weird again. Wanting to change the very nature of a dog? Come on, how ridiculous can I be? If that's what you're thinking, then take it up with God. The idea is God's. What I wish I could have done for Blazer, God really wants to do with us and can do with us. He doesn't want us just to change behavior. He doesn't want us to simply learn to quit doing the disgusting when others can see you. He doesn't ever say to us, quit acting like a fallen, imperfect, sinful, flawed human. 
He absolutely wants to change our nature. Before he ever says, change your behavior. He said it to Ezekiel. I will put a new way of thinking inside of you. I will take the stubborn hearts of stone from your bodies and I'll give you obedience hearts of flesh. I will put my spirit inside of you and help you live by my rules and carefully obey my laws. You see, God doesn't want to send us to obedience school and say, you better learn new habits. You better clean up your act. You better quit acting like a sinful human and loving the way a sinful human does it. You better quit looking out for number one and start putting others before yourself. He doesn't send us to obedience school. He first sends us to the hospital to get a new heart, to change our very nature so that we then can be obedient, so that we can change the disgusting habit, so that we can love others the way he has told us that we are morally obligated to love. He doesn't say simply rearrange your life. He says, I want to change your life. And you see, that's the point I think John is making over and over again in in his first letter. We've been looking at that on the Sundays of the summer. He, He didn't simply say, quit sinning. He said, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. You see, the not sinning is contingent on the knowing. He didn't say, quit sinning and you'll come to know Christ. He said, come to know Christ. And your nature will be so changed that what you couldn't stop before, stop deliberate and continual sinning, all of a sudden you'll be able to do. Why? Because you went to obedience school? Because you rearranged a few things in your life? Because you stopped a few bad habits? No. Because your very nature was changed. He didn't say to you and me, you got to love one another. He said, dear friends, Let us love one another because love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. You see, our ability to love that one who is unlovable, to really love that one who has hurt us or betrayed us or disappointed us is contingent on one thing. Have we really been born of God? Do we really know him? He said, if you really come to know Christ, all of a sudden, You'll be able to do what you thought was impossible, love that particular person. Why? Because you went to obedience school and learned to bite your tongue when you felt like saying the sarcastic and the hurtful back? Because you trained yourself to do the nice and to be kind even when you've been treated in in terrible ways? Because you've rearranged a few things in your life? No, no, a thousand times no. Because your very nature has been changed. Last week when we looked at God's plan for us when we feel like hating, though we don't call it hating, he he told us us, our plan for us is for you and me and and anyone who calls himself a Christ follower, his plan is for us to love that person. In fact, we saw, number one, as a Christian, it is our obligation. There aren't any loopholes. There aren't any exceptions. Your hurt will never be so great that God will say to you, okay, just this one time with that particularly nasty person, I'm going to let you out of your obligation. Go ahead and hate them. That's not going to happen. Secondly, we saw the outline. We saw the outline of what this kind of love looks like. God is the source. Jesus is the standard. It absolutely includes establishing proper boundaries, but most importantly, it is selfless, putting others first. And then we saw the outcome. By loving in this manner, this is the only way you and I will experience a satisfying, contented, joy-filled, victorious life. It's the only way we will experience and know the healing for our brokenness. It's the only way we'll be able to move forward in life and be able to grow and experience his joy and and his peace. And after hearing that sermon, you, you could have responded, I suppose, in one of three ways. When the Lord brought that particular nasty person's face to your mind and you knew, you knew after what they did to you or said about you or what they did to those that you love, what you felt like doing was hating that person, though you don't call it hate because we know Christians aren't supposed to hate. But in that moment of honesty, when you admitted to yourself and to God that what you felt like doing was to hate, you could have responded in one of three ways. Number one, you could have denied it. 
you listened to that sermon and felt kind of guilty because you knew there was someone you hated and, and you felt like I was preaching right at you. And like you felt like someone must have gone into my office and, and, and told me all about how you hated so and so. And even though you felt guilty, you thought to yourself, I've tried and failed in the past. I know there's no way I can ever love that person. Uh, they, they have done the immoral and they're still doing the immoral. They hurt me, not just once, but many times and on purpose. They're, they're such a hypocrite. They, they act so Christian when they're at church, but they live like the devil the other time. I, I can't love them. And so even though you felt convicted by the Holy Spirit and you felt guilty for hating, you, you did absolutely nothing because you convinced yourself, I can't. And so you denied it and it denied applying it to your life and your relationship. Or number two, you could have tried it. You realized there are no exceptions to the command, and so you went out in your own strength that determined that you were going to put it into practice. You rolled up your sleeves, and, and you went to work. You rearranged a few things. You promised yourself you'd bite your tongue and not say the sarcastic or the spiteful. It, you, you wouldn't tell others what that low-down, no-good, bottom dwelling scum sucker they, that they were, and it, you were going to do your best. You weren't going to throw any darts at them, not with words or not with your looks. You didn't, sh sh but what happened when they showed up in a conversation or they showed up in your life? You couldn't do it. You, you tried, but you couldn't do it. You discovered in your own strength you couldn't do it. Or number three, you actually went out and did it. You realize because you're a follower of Jesus, because you've asked God to not simply rearrange your life, but to change your life. You realize that God was going to give you everything you needed to love that person. And so you went out and you did your best to show them authentic love. And every time you thought you couldn't, God stepped up right alongside of you and gave you what you needed so you could show love to that person. And I'm persuaded it's that kind of radical change in us and in our nature that John is emphasizing in the first five verses of chapter 5. If you haven't yet, turn over to 1 John chapter 5. We're going to read starting in verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. That's the change. That's the change in nature. Born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. And his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God, change in nature, overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Okay, let's look, let's look at what it means to really allow God to change our very nature so that we can be overcomers, so that we can be victorious, so we can love even those hard-to-love people who are in our life. First of all, we're going to need to understand some definitions here. That's letter A in your notes, the definitions. There are three critical words that John uses in these five verses that we absolutely need to understand because if we don't, it's going to completely mess up our understanding of what John is saying. Now, they're very common words, which you probably think you already know the definition to these words. You would never, ever even look them up in the dictionary because they're so common, everyone understands them. Well, the truth is, we all understand the English words that are being used but they don't really catch the full color and the full meaning of the Greek words that John used. It, it would be like me trying to describe to a person from Hawaii who has never experienced the changing of the seasons, how the trees in Illinois change color uh, in the fall time. I, I could tell them all about the brilliant reds and, and yellows and oranges that the leaves become. I could tell them how they are absolutely stunning to look at. I could tell how, how every fall people load up in tour buses and drive down south and, and go just to look at these trees. And, and while that person from Hawaii would be able to tell that I'm really impressed with the colors by the words I say, they wouldn't be impressed with the changing of the trees until they actually saw what I was talking about. I don't think you'll be all that impressed with what John says until you see the color of the Greek words that John is using here. The first word we need to understand is burdensome. J John used that word in verse 3, you saw it. He said, and his commands, the Lord's commands, are not burdensome. Now that's really interesting because the Greek word used there means not beyond our ability 
to keep those commands. The word doesn't mean light or easy or, or never having a struggle involved. It simply means not beyond our ability to keep those commands. You see, we hear the English word burdensome and we think, well, it must be no big deal. We think if something isn't burdensome, it, it won't be hard to do. But when we hear the command, you must love one another, you are morally obligated to love one another. And when we think about that person we hate, or we don't call it hate, we think it is extremely burdensome. We think it's too hard to do. It's too heavy. And if we weren't in church, where we want to protect our quote-unquote Christian image, we'd read that verse, and his commands are not burdensome, and we'd laugh out loud and say, what a joke. I'd never, I'd never tried anything more tough in all my life than to love that stinker of a person. So when John says the Lord's commands are not burdensome, he's not saying it's easy to obey. Simply, it's not beyond our ability to do that if, and this is a huge if, if our very nature has been changed, if we've been born of God. That's why two times in five short verses, he refers to the fact that the person must be born of God to follow the commands. A, a person who has not been born of God, a person who has not experienced this change in their nature, will absolutely find the commands of God burdensome. They are way beyond their ability to do. They, they really can say, I can't do it. I can't love that person because they can't. Because their very nature hasn't been changed. It can only happen when you've been born of God. So that's the first word we need to understand. Second word he used there that we need to understand is believe. John used it twice, same word. In verse 1 he says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And then down in verse 5 he uses the same word again and he says, who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Now when John uses the word believe, he's He's not using the Greek word that simply meant intellectual assent. That's a completely different word they had. He's not saying, this is something I understand and I believe it to be true, but it makes no real difference in my life. You see, I believe that E equals MC squared. I believe that, but I don't have a clue about what Einstein's theory of relativity means practically. It might have some effect on my life, but I don't know it. I believe it because Einstein was a genius and people way smarter than I say it's true. So I believe E equals MC squared. But that belief doesn't change how I live. The word John uses for belief doesn't mean simply an intellectual understanding on some level. He means a belief that affects actions. We believe something so much that it becomes the deciding factor in the choices and the decisions we make in everyday living. So the person who says, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, the Savior, the one who says, I believe Jesus is the Christ means they believe that so much that while they have the choice not to obey him, they know if they don't. They are rejecting what God, the holy, awesome creator, is saying to them. They are saying to the God they say they believe in, I know better than you. And it doesn't affect how they believe, so they don't really believe. The kind of belief that John is talking about is a belief that affects all of our actions, all of the time, with every person, in every situation. You believe in the Christ and what he has said. The third word we need to understand is the word overcome. Get this, that, that Greek word for overcome is Nike, J just like the shoe, just do it. But it's really interesting to me because what that word means, listen to this, this is going to touch something deep within yourself. It means continuous victory in continuous struggle. Continuous victory in continuous struggle. And you see, that's interesting to me because oftentimes when I have thought of being an overcomer, or overcoming some personal struggle, I had thought that it meant fight the battle, win with the Lord's help, and then never ever have to fight that battle again. And there have been times when I've been surprised and almost blown out of the water, when I had to fight the same temptation, the same battle all over again that I won last week or last year. 
But John is using the word for overcome. It doesn't mean fight the battle, win the battle, and never fight that battle again. It means continuous victory in continuous struggle. Guess what? That person you feel like hating, though you don't call it hating, it may be for you a continuous struggle for you to love that person. Even though you prayed about it. Even though you said, Lord, help me love that person. Love that person through me. And you knew God was doing something wonderful in your life. You may still continue to struggle, but in the struggle you can know and experience continuous victory. So we need to understand to overcome the internal struggle and follow the command of God doesn't mean win the battle, never fight that same battle again. It simply means continuous victory in continuous struggle. I don't know about you, but that really helps me. There have been too many times when I've struggled with the command of God or struggled with an attitude or struggled with the temptation, and I prayed and prayed, and I'd be victorious, and I'd praise God because I overcame. But then that same struggle came back a week later or a month later, or the next time I saw that particular person, and I believed Satan's lie when he perched himself on my shoulder and whispered in my ear, see, you weren't victorious. You didn't, you didn't overcome that temptation. If you had, you wouldn't be thinking those thoughts again. You, you wouldn't be feeling that way towards that person. You, you didn't overcome anything. So it's crucial we understand what John meant when he used these three words. To overcome means continuous victory and continuous struggle. To believe means a belief that affects actions. And if something is not burdensome, that means not beyond our ability to keep the commands. So we looked at the definitions. Let's look at the details next. That's the letter B in your notes, the details. What will result if our very nature has been changed because we've been born of God? How can we be assured that, that we will be a part of those that are victorious? How can we know for certain that we will be overcomers? Uh, the details of what John is saying here is so crucial. We need to apply them to our life. Let's look at them. Three principles. But they're not stair-step principles where you follow this principle and then you take the next step and do that one and then take the next step. These three are all woven together. They are linked together. They, they are inseparable. You can't do two of them and then say, I'll forget the third one. You, you can't say, well, let me try to get that first one down really good and, and then I'll tackle the next one. It doesn't work that way. They come as a package. And, and the only way you'll be able to be an overcomer and be victorious continually is if these three principles just become a part of your very nature. The first principle is believing God. We, we've already talked about what John means by belief, a belief that affects action. Not simply intellectually understanding something. Not simply saying, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. I believe he's the Son of God. You see, Satan believes that. The demons believe that. James said in his letter, you believe that there's one God good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. So it's not that kind of belief that we're talking about. We're talking about a belief that affects our actions no matter what the circumstances are of our life. It means believing in what the word of God teaches, even if we don't understand the why behind those words, but because we know the who that is behind those words, we believe them and then we act on that belief. So when you read the word and it says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers, that belief you have in God and what he says affects your choices concerning who you date and who you marry and who you go to into business with or who you allow to have influence in your life. When you read the word and, and it says, turn the other cheek and go the second mile, when you read, do everything without complaining and arguing, if you really believe in Jesus Christ, that sort of limits your options as a Christian on what your response will be to that person. If you and I are going to be overcomers, which means continuous victory and continuous struggle, we have to put into practice this first principle of belief. Do you really believe God's word so much so that it affects all of your action? It affects the kind of husband or wife you are, the kind of parent you are, the kind of neighbor you are, the kind of employee or employer you are, the kind of student you are. You, you believe in him so much that you do what he says even when it's not the easiest thing to do. The Senka principle is obeying God. Uh, you see how interwoven that is with believing? If you really believe in who Jesus is, you're going to obey what he said. 
In fact, John says, this is love for God, to obey his commands. If we're going to be people who are overcomers, who know continuous victory, we have to understand there is this principle of obedience that must be a part of our lives. Uh, This is something that's taught all throughout the scripture. Jesus, in the last week of his life, told the disciples, you are my friends if you do what I command. Paul said, let us keep in step with the Spirit. That is the principle of obedience. The writer of the Hebrew letter wrote, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. That, too, is the principle of obedience. James is the one who wrote, what good is it, my brothers? If a man claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Or in using the words of the principle John is describing, belief without obedience is dead. It's useless. It, it means nothing. They go together. They're woven together. Belief without obedience is nothing. And John takes it a step further by saying his commands are not burdensome, which again means not beyond, not beyond our ability to do what he's asked once he's changed our very nature. If that's true, and it certainly is, some of us should probably change what we say. Instead of saying, I can't forgive, we better say, I won't forgive. Because God's word says he won't ask you to do something that is beyond our ability. Instead of saying, I can't stop that, we better say, I won't. Instead of saying, I can't love that person, we better say, I won't love that person because God's commands are not burdensome. They are not beyond our ability to do if our nature has been changed. Well, if all of that's true, if God's commands are not beyond our ability... How come they sure feel burdensome at times? And how come there are so many who are defeated continually rather than experiencing continuous victory? Well, that brings us to the third principle for overcoming. There's the principle of believing. There's the principle of obeying. And we know they're woven together. But there's a third principle that's also woven in. And that's the principle of really loving God. You see, John said something in those verses that you might have just skipped over when we read it. I know I did the first time I read it. But if you'd really stop and think about it, it's not what most of us would have expected John to say. In chapter 4, he gives the command to love others. Whoever loves God must love his brother. A command, strong, definite language. Nothing wishy-washy about it. No loopholes, no exceptions. Whoever loves God must ought, is morally obligated to love his brother. And then John immediately follows that up by saying something I don't think we expected. In in, in verse 2 of chapter 5, he asks, how do we know we love the children of God? We would expect John to say, "By by doing loving things for them, by forgiving those that have wronged us, by giving to that one in need, by not keeping a record of wrongs. After all, that's what God's word teaches about authentic love. But we can't do those things until we have first done what John tells us to do here. How do we love the children of God? How how do we do the commands God has given us? How, How do we do those things that we think we can't do? It's not by trying harder. It's not by rolling up your sleeves and saying, this time will be different. It's not by simply believing right or having a renewed determination to obey or by rearranging a few things in your life. But verse 2 says, it happens by us loving God. It starts there. By us first really loving God. It all goes back to that perfect love that John is talking about. A love that originates with God, starts with God, and empowers us to do what we thought we couldn't do. If you want to be an overcomer, knowing continuous victory and continuous struggle, fall in love with God. Spend time with Him in prayer. Come to really know him through the word. Worship him in settings like this. Don't look on churches, oh, I have to do it. Look on it, I get to. I can't wait. I get to spend time with the one I love. Folks, I'm telling you something very dramatic will happen in our spiritual lives if we really experience the perfect love where God changes our very nature and empowers us to do what he's asked us to do. That's why John could say, 
his commands are not burdensome. They weren't beyond John's ability to keep because his nature had been transformed and empowered and energized by love of God. And that's what God wants to do in you and me. He's not about giving us commands we can't follow. He's not about asking us to do what he knows we can't do. He doesn't want us to be overwhelmed with guilt feelings and being defeated. He doesn't want us joyless and and, and not knowing his peace. He wants us to be an overcomer. Continuous victory and continuous struggle. So let me ask you, do you need more than just a rearrangement of your life? But do you need a change in your very nature so that you can be known as an overcomer? I don't know if you remember the song. We, we haven't sung it for years. But the words say, my life has been changed, not just rearranged. From the inside out, the difference is plain to see. His love captured me. His grace set me free. His mercy flows all the way from Calvary. And then the chorus says, Jesus, thank you for a brand new start. Jesus, thank you for a brand new heart. I was lost in sin. When you took me in, you gave me life again and called me friend. That's exactly what John is saying to us, that God really wants to change our very nature so that we can do what he is asking of us. And we really can become overcomers, knowing continuous victory in spite of continuous struggle. So let me ask you one more time. Do you need more than just a rearrangement of your life? Do you need a change in your very nature so that you can be known as an overcomer? Bow your heads with me. Lord, once again, we thank you for this great week we've had. We thank you for your promises and your word. We thank you that you have told us we really can be overcomers, that you don't send us to obedience school, but you say, I can change your very nature and empower you to do what I'm asking you to do. And I ask, Lord, that this very day, if we're struggling, that this would be the day we would realize we can know continuous victory and continuous struggle because we've allowed you, Holy Spirit, to change our very nature. We've been born of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.